send me an email at voshvideo.com with your perspective on the issue with the intent of being critical um, because I don't learn from praise. I guess I learn a little from praise, but I learn more from not praise, okay? <laughs>although the later sections do rely on claims made in earlier sections. In the description, you can find a link to the script, which has copious citations for every clip used and every claim made. Obviously, you don't need to read it, but do know I come bearing copious receipts. Winning a debate and winning the audience are not necessarily always the same things. Uh, whether or not they overlap depends pretty much exclusively with how good faith the conversation is held in. In a very bad faith conversation, there can often be a really severe disconnect between the technical procession of arguments throughout the course of the events of the debate and who's believed to have won at the end. When you're having a conversation, whether you're trying to find the truth, persuade someone, or persuade an audience, You'll be exchanging ideas, and in order for that to proceed smoothly, you'll need something called good faith. Good faith implies a number of things. Sincerity, honesty, openness, and charity. This basically means you'll be playing by the rules. You aren't trying to win the conversation through duplicitous means, and the outcome of the conversation is reflective of the quality of ideas exchanged. One of these ideas merits special attention. Charity. Being charitable is attempting to interpret your opponent's statements in the best manner possible, and you may have heard this referred to as steel manning. This is the opposite of straw manning, a duplicitous tactic where you purposefully attack a weaker version of your opponent's argument than what they actually presented. Most of Vosh's debates are blood sports with enemies, and it's honestly incredible how bad faith and uncharitable some of these conversations can be. While it may be obvious to the casual observer that something is wrong, to fully understand how bad they really are, you would need to watch the conversation several times while taking notes. A good example is debating white supremacy with Count Dankula. This debate happened because Vosh accused Dankula of being a white supremacist, Dankula disagreed, so Vosh challenged him to a debate. Already, this is insanely bad faith. Vosh is refusing to take him at his word, and his only evidence in this debate is a couple of edgy tweets and jokes, knowing full well that Dankula is an edgy comedian. Telling edgy jokes is literally his job, and Vosh of all people should understand this because Vosh is also an edgy comedian. Um, I think in regards to it, I think when it comes to comedy, you can joke about absolutely anything and everything. I just um, want to I say, I've, I've joked, oh sorry, please, I didn't mean no, to No, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, I joke thing. about different groups of people all the time on my stream. I've joked about transgender people, I've joked about black people, I've joked about Jews. Who oh boy, have I done all of those things. I think that we should be able to make jokes about anything, literally anything. I would defend that to my dying breath. And I hate that there are some lefties who are legitimately like humorless fucking, uh, uh, bad words. For almost everything Dankula says, there are two available explanations. The good faith explanation is that this is an edgy comedian telling edgy jokes, while the bad faith explanation is that these are proof of racism. So arguing that Dankula is a white supremacist because he told edgy jokes is, in the strictest literal sense, Vosh being bad faith and attempting to burn a straw man. Good faith isn't even possible here, but it's made all the more amusing by something we'll learn later in the debate. Dankula is not a white supremacist. This is the worst I've ever seen Vosh lose a debate, and to the best of my knowledge, Dankula doesn't even do debates. This never needed to happen, and it's a great example of how rhetoric can't save you if you are hilariously and totally wrong. The debate begins with the moderator asking both parties to define white supremacy. Just to clarify the term first. Sure, yeah. So, um, generally speaking, when I say white supremacist, I'm referring to a person who believes that there is A, some sort of fundamental distinction between um, the races, uh, and B, uh, one who believes that either the white race is, has, is superior in some empirical sense, or B, that we need to engage in policies or other social actions to prioritize that group of people. 
person who feels that white people are superior to all other races and all other races are, you know, are or should be subservient to whites and things should be done only for the benefit of whites. When they give their responses, they agree almost entirely. And they both basically give the Google definition. Both of these definitions are functional. So now that we agree on definitions, we can proceed in good faith, right? Vaj, do you have any issues with that definition? Yeah, that's not the actual definition at all. That's a highly unacademic definition of white supremacy. Uh, what that does is it sets the bar so high that there's no way to ever prove that anyone is a white supremacist because they would have to buy into a <laughs> fuck ton of positions before they would actually fit that qualification. Do you see where this is going? After giving almost identical definitions that match the Google definition, Vosh denigrates Stankula's definition as being highly unacademic and tries to shift to a definition so vague it could reasonably apply to anyone. What Vosh is doing here is attacking anything and everything Dankula says, even if Vosh said the exact same thing a minute earlier. So less than two minutes in and this is already a shit show. Here are some examples of bad faith engagement just from the first six minutes of this conversation. Okay. Yeah, cool. Well, I, hey, listen, if I hey, believe it or not, I don't like the fact that there are white supremacists in the world. I doubt you do either. Now, think about this for a second. Wouldn't a white supremacist want more white supremacists in the world? This is an admission that Dankula is not a white supremacist, but Vosh continues to argue that Dankula is a white supremacist for the next two hours anyway. So instead, what I think would be more interesting is if I proceed under the assumption of good faith. This is a Vosh classic, a false claim of good faith while being incredibly bad faith. We'll be seeing this over and over again. Take note when Vosh claims to be doing a good thing, because he's probably about to do the opposite. Yeah, I have to inductively reason it, but I think for the purposes of the discussion, it's better to walk through my thought process as I come to discover your content and the way that you talk and engage with stuff, rather than presumptively making the accusation and then like post-talk going over all the assumed evidence. Did you catch that? Presumptively making the accusation and then post-talk going over all the assumed evidence is exactly what Vosh did and is currently doing. That's why this conversation happened. And this is what Vosh typically does when he accuses people of being fascist or Nazis. Um, you're going to say the term, it's just a joke, do you know what a joke is, mate, or I'm a fucking comedian, about 80 times over the course of this discussion. We're not going to have any way of actually reasoning out anyone's positions, and it will end because up being a complete waste of time. So we're because going to see how that goes. Just, are, we, are we going head first in and saying that it's just a joke, I'm a comedian, are completely invalid arguments that hold no No, 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 I just want to see how many times you say them. They're totally valid arguments, and I have made but, them in the but, past. But, but, okay then, so basically you're probably going to ask me a lot about jokes I've made and the actual arguments that explain these jokes, you're trying to preemptively discredit those arguments by going, oh, if I, if I tell him this, he's probably going to say this when what I'm going to say is a valid argument. The fact that you are preemptively you're, you're defending pre the it's just a joke defense is very telling to the kind of conversation that we're about to have. This exchange is unbelievable. Vosh poisons the well by saying Dankula will try and use the it's just a joke defense, then concedes that this defense is valid. Then he poisons the well again and attacks Dankula further for using a defense that he conceded is valid less than 20 seconds earlier. Also, let this be made as clear as possible. Vosh has allowed the it's just a joke defense, which means winning the debate is now impossible, as Vosh has no arguments outside of what could be reasonably explained as an edgy comedian making edgy jokes. It's also worth pointing out that when Vosh says the conversation will be a complete waste of time, he's trying to discredit a debate that he very likely knows he cannot win. Unreal. Absolutely unreal. And this is all in the first six minutes of the conversation, by the way. This much bullshit was crammed into six minutes. Later in the conversation, Vosh concedes that Dankula's YouTube videos didn't seem that bad. Vosh says that Dankula's not an anti-Semite. Vosh says that Dankula isn't malicious or nefarious. Dankula and Vosh agree on immigration. We learn that Dankula's anti-colonialism. They agree on censorship, Antifa, and tankies. And Dankula expresses without prompting that people have a responsibility to keep racists out of their communities. Let's see how this debate ends. I have no idea why these people hate trans people so much. I mean, they suck the best dick. I'm telling you, man. You, thank you for turning a sin sincere like, advocacy like into a joke. I, I'm, I'm it's true though, like, it's true. My no, audience is no agreeing other. with you though. Like no other, like honestly, women treat your dick like it's a chore. Transsexual women treat your dick like it's their god. And let's just take a look at Vosh's chat. Yeah, that's about as well as this can go. 
Vosh actually concedes, although he does so in a very roundabout way so as to save face. But there isn't any mistake. This was an extremely bad faith conversation from Vosh, and he can't even plainly admit that he's wrong without making a bunch of statements to optically hedge his defeat. Did he learn a lesson about falsely accusing people of being white supremacists? Did he grow as a person? What was he concerned with at the end of the conversation? Let's see. Hey, man. Oh. Oh, God. All right. That was... That was the most, um, that was the most difficult fucking, fucking optical juggle I've ever done in my life. This is almost certainly an admission that, one, Vosh is almost entirely concerned with optics, not the truth, and two, he knows he was acting in bad faith. This is further cemented by the thumbnail. You'd think after admitting that Dankula isn't a white supremacist, he would be happy to absolve him, right? No. There's no ambiguity here, this is just horrendous, and as bad as this conversation was, the prime case fascism shit show was much worse. I was going to cover some other conversations to drive the point home, but I have an even better idea. What if Fosh plainly admitted to behaving in bad faith? Hunter Avalon was a conservative YouTuber who switched to being a centrist sock dem over the course of 2020, partially due to conversations with Vosh, and has become one of Vosh's closer friends in the YouTube space. Let's hear Vosh's recollection of these events. Yeah, reminder by the way, the only reason that I ever tried to talk to Hunter Avalon the way that I did was because I talked to Shu on head beforehand. I thought that Hunter Avalon was just another like dumb fuck, no principles conservative. Shu on head messaged me and said like, hey, I've like met Hunter Avalon before. I think that he's like an authentic guy. Like I think he actually cares about the stuff that he believes in. And that's the only reason everything following with me and Hunter Avalon happened. Vosh is just straight up admitting that he would have treated Hunter the way he treats every other conservative, admitting that he does not treat them in good faith. Now, ask yourself, given that Vosh treated Hunter in good faith, and given that Vosh helped Hunter change his political views, what good could have been done if Vosh just treated conservatives like people? My goal when watching this is going to be pointing out any bad arguments or any instances where I feel these people are acting in bad faith. That is my goal. One of the benefits of the type of content that I do is that you never have to worry about me taking stuff out of context. When Vosh watches a video and pauses it constantly, it can be incredibly misleading. You may get the impression that you've absorbed the content because you technically watched it, but if you were to go back and watch the video Vosh covered on its own, you'd likely feel you were experiencing it for the first time. We're going to be looking at one of Vosh's videos that responds to a podcast by Sam Harris. Vosh only watches 6 minutes of Sam Harris's 113 minute podcast, or roughly 5% of the content, so 95% of the context is missing. Keep this in the back of your mind, because nearly all of Vosh's claims about Harris can be refuted with context from the other 107 minutes. It's also worth pointing out that Vosh is responsible for what he does with his platform. Vosh could have either listened to the whole podcast beforehand to address things with context, or gone over the whole thing, or not covered it at all. If it is the case that Vosh cherry-picked a small segment and misrepresented Harris's arguments, there's no excuse for that. Vosh chose to cover it on stream, and Vosh chose to post the video, so any misrepresentations are Vosh's responsibility. There's one thing to clear up before we get into the content. The distinction between interpersonal and systemic racism. Well, sure, but systemic racism doesn't even need racist people at the helm. Systemic racism perpetuates itself through, like, systemic inequality. If you have a society where absolutely nobody is racially biased, but black people start off with less, the way economics works ensures that they'll continue to have less, at least for a very long time. This is a topic Vosch discusses frequently, so he should not be confused by the distinction. On screen now are various quotes from the podcast Vosch is responding to, that demonstrate irrefutably that Harris acknowledges the existence of systemic racism. One in particular should drive the point home. As I've already acknowledged, there is a legacy of racism in the United States that we are still struggling to outgrow. That is obvious. There are real racists out there. And there are ways in which racism became institutionalized a long time ago. Many of you will remember that during the crack epidemic, the penalties for crack and powder cocaine were quite different. 
and this led black drug offenders to be locked up for much longer than white ones. Now, whether the motivation for that policy was consciously racist or not, I don't know. But it was effectively racist. And how about another? How much of this inequality is due to the legacy of slavery? And how much of it is due to the ensuing century of racist policies? I'm prepared to think quite a lot. And it strikes me as totally legitimate to think about paying reparations as a possible remedy here. Of course, one will then need to talk about reparations for the Native Americans. Harris absolutely affirms the existence of systemic racism. What Harris questions in the podcast is the degree to which interpersonal racism plays a part in police use of force. This is crucially important because, as we can see from the video title, Vosch's main argument against Harris is that he denies the existence of systemic racism, which is demonstrably untrue. Let's see how this video begins. I'm going to make an effort to be as charitable as possible to the arguments that I hear. Remember what happens when Vosch claims to be doing a good thing. So how does Vosch present Harris's argument? We're going to quickly cover every single thing Harris says and every single time Vosch pauses. I will summarize these to move through quickly, but feel free to pause or check the script for sources if you're interested. Vosch begins by agreeing with Harris's claim and then vaguely gesturing at systemic racism, implying that Harris would disagree. But as we have already demonstrated, Harris enthusiastically affirms the existence of systemic racism. Get used to this pattern of Vosch agreeing with Harris's claim and then vaguely gesturing at Harris denying systemic racism, because that's almost the entire video. Then Vosch implies Harris believes in scientific racism and implies that Harris would deny the existence of systemic racism. Harris doesn't. Then Vosch responds to Harris misquoting statistics. And Vosch would be correct, but he has to throw in misinformation at the end. This should be the easiest win for Vosch in the world, but he has to insist that these numbers only apply to arrests and not incarcerations. This would imply that the state is less likely to imprison black people for violent crimes when Vosch repeatedly argues the opposite and the data shows the opposite. This is an example of a frequent trend. Even when Vosch says things that are true, he often exaggerates them to the point of falsehood. Then Vosch implies that Harris is attempting to justify racist policies, which he clearly isn't. Again, Harris proposed paying reparations in this podcast. Then Harris makes the most controversial statement of the podcast, and Vosch just agrees with it. Also, can someone please explain to me what low-level murder is? Uh, honestly, I want an explanation. What is low-level murder? Then Vosch pauses to agree with Harris again, while trying to put words in Harris's mouth. Then Vosch implies once again that Harris denies the existence of systemic racism, and yada yada yada, you get the picture. Then Vosch says that Harris is strawmanning Black Lives Matter into only being about police reform, which Harris never said, and in fact Harris specifically called out systemic injustice in our legal system beyond simply the police. It's also worth pointing out that Harris explicitly made an argument for defunding the police in this podcast. And then Vosch does this. So let's give him a chance to respond. I don't even know what to say to this. Vosh has been ranting for six minutes at this point, and 20 minutes into his video, he's only played roughly two minutes of Harris talking. Harris doesn't get a chance to respond, my dude. Then Vosh accuses Harris of misdirection while misdirecting. Harris is not a conservative. He takes every available opportunity to trash Trump, and while some people may point out that Vosh is only implying Harris is a conservative here, Vosh will go on to directly state that later, so the intention to communicate this idea is quite clear. Then Vosh accuses Harris of supporting militarized policing, when Harris explicitly condemned this in this podcast. Then Vosh just agrees with Harris on police brutality. Then Vosh starts to get incredibly bad faith. Remember how Vosh has been grilling Harris for denying systemic racism for this entire video? What Harris is laying out here is an explicit case for systemic racism. Does Vosh realize his mistake and give Harris credit? No, Vosh interrupts Harris to insult him, so his audience will forget what Harris is saying. 25% more likely to use pepper spray or a baton. I will give Sam Harris credit for one thing, if nothing else. He is the perfect cadence and vocal tone for a pseudo-intellectual. Up until this point, you may have been able to make a case that Vosh was just irresponsible, 
But this isn't just irresponsible. This is malicious. And now Vosh is strawmanning Harris. Harris is quoting several studies, including the Johnson study, which has a conclusion that controls for proximity. Again, this is where the interpersonal racism and systemic racism distinction becomes important. Harris is arguing against the idea that interpersonal racism among police is responsible for these issues, and arguing instead that systemic racism is what we should be focusing on. Vosh agrees with this argument elsewhere, he's simply refusing to acknowledge that this is what Harris is actually saying. Then Vosh proceeds to misunderstand Harris's argument while also calling Harris's argument dumb. Again, Harris is arguing against interpersonal racism and for systemic racism. And then Vosh plays the last Harris quote, takes Harris out of context, misrepresents Harris's argument, calls Harris an anti-intellectual, calls Harris a conservative, and once again asserts that Harris denies the existence of systemic racism. Vosh consistently misrepresents Harris's argument and slings ad homs, and even when Vosh is correct, he undermines his own argument by exaggerating things to the point of falsehood. How does Vosh feel about this? I think I'm comfortable from the section of this podcast that I've listened to in understanding Sam Harris's approach. In essence, he is very comfortable invoking the black rate of criminality without providing any explanation. He will dismiss evidence which does not favor his point, and then he will assign to these studies a correlative data point which was not backed by the researchers, which actually once more places the blame on black people. This is a blatant lie. Maybe this wouldn't be so bad if Fosch were merely misunderstanding an argument, but I think it's considerably worse. Which actually once more places the blame on black people. Because that is what people like Sam Harris want to do. But I do know that his narrative here is one which perfectly suits the mentality of the American racist. It's every lazy, ad hoc, biased dismissal of the overwhelming evidence in favor of systemic racism in favor of an explanation which is at once non-explanatory and also very deeply suggestive of a biological problem with black people. They're rather fond of that, aren't they? I don't think I've argued with a conservative once who wasn't willing to at least suggest or imply a genetic explanation for black criminality. Okay, why is their culture the way it is? And they'll go, I don't know. Why is their culture the way it is? And without falling back on sociological explanations for that question, the only remaining answer is one which they know they can't substantiate in academia, so they do not directly state. The genetic explanation. Anyway, I don't want to appear as uncharitable to Sam Harris. Yeah. Watch out for any time Vosh claims to be doing a good thing. Watching 5% of a video, lying to your audience about its arguments, and then calling the person you're responding to a racist is not good faith engagement. Do you think that's the end of the quote right there? When you see a video like this, and a quote is provided, and it begins and ends mid-sentence, do you think that's an accurate representation? Trust me, speaking as Vosh, it's pretty easy to cut people out of context. Aggressively easy, one might say. Equivocation is the weaponization of ambiguous language by assigning a single idea multiple meanings, then switching between them as needed. As it just so happens, I happen to have caught a great example of this on Twitter. Now, I'm not trying to be mean to Viv, I'm going to say nice things about her later, but this exchange was a perfect example of equivocation. First, Viv says that arbitrary means a system without rational justification, then in her next tweet says that arbitrary can mean anything you like, because meaning is subjective. These are mutually exclusive, so which is it? If she's allowed to establish both meanings, she can switch between the definitions of arbitrary based on whatever best suits her needs at the time. This is the essence of equivocation, an unreasonable willingness to shift the meaning of words around based on whatever happens to be convenient. Vosh equivocates constantly, but in particular I'd like to discuss his insistence on calling the people he disagrees with Nazis. Now imagine a scale of Nazidom. On the far end, you have a person who's willing to violently establish an ethnostate. Lower than that, you might have attending Nazi rallies or saying things like, 
The Holocaust didn't happen, but I wish it did. Below that, you might have someone who clearly questions the traditional Holocaust narrative but isn't committed to a rejection, or someone who clearly harbors racist feelings but isn't willing to do anything about them. Then way down at the bottom, you might have an insensitive boomer comment like, there sure are a lot of black people on this beach. These are clearly not the same thing. The last is an insensitive statement that might belie racism or ignorance or cultural differences or any other number of things. It clearly doesn't demonstrate that someone is a racist, but it might be a behavior indicative of Nazi beliefs. So it's included as the very smallest possible hint of this belief structure. There's a reasonable discussion to be had about where the line should be drawn for someone to be considered a Nazi, but it's not reasonable to use the same term for all of these different behaviors. Now, I'm sure you can see where this is going. Vosh equivocates all of these behaviors into the single label Nazi and will freely apply it to people who don't even reasonably meet the lowest qualification. A good example is PewDiePie, who we'll call Felix, one of the biggest YouTubers with over 100 million subscribers. Vosh made four videos where he directly states or strongly implies that Felix is a Nazi more than 20 times. And I also think that PewDiePie is a member of the alt-right. Some kind of reactionary, fascist, neo-Nazi, maybe. Calling someone a Nazi is a serious claim, so Vosh would need a lot of evidence to justify it, especially over the Occam's Razor explanation that Felix is just an edgy gamer bro. Here are all of the arguments Vosh makes to justify calling Felix a Nazi in those four videos. Now, this might seem like a good case, right? Nope. First, Felix has 100 million subscribers. Of course he's going to have some number of Nazis in his audience. Anyone with that many fans would. That doesn't mean anything, nor does the fact that some Nazis like him. The band Depeche Mode and Taylor Swift were both repeatedly endorsed by white supremacists and leaders of supremacist organizations, and these musicians all disavowed these supremacist groups in public statements. Are we going to assume that Tay-Tay is a Nazi now? Of course not. Felix also publicly denounced white supremacist and white supremacist groups repeatedly. Felix makes edgy jokes because that is his job, which Vosh should understand as he is also an edgy comedian. These three are ludicrous accusations that never should have been made, and while I understand that some people are particularly sensitive to jokes involving dressing up as a Nazi, this is historically very common. I can understand why you would be uncomfortable with this, but this is simply not evidence that Charlie Chaplin, Sarah Silverman, or Charlie Day are Nazis. Next, Felix withdrew a donation to the ADL, a Jewish organization. Now, that could be interpreted as a symptom of Nazi beliefs, but then you would have to wonder why would he donate to them in the first place? There's a much better explanation. Felix donated to them to try and do something nice, then realized they had publicly slandered him and withdrew his support as he didn't want to donate to an organization which slandered him in the past. For the record, Felix actually defended the ADL during this while Vosh denigrated them. I don't think the charity is as bad as everyone says, but at the same time, it just didn't make sense for me to donate it to it. Hey guys, it's true. The ADL is actually like hot garbage. Not joking. It's real fucking bad. Now, I'll be honest with you. I hate the ADL. Now, what does it even mean that Felix didn't denounce the Nazis in his community enthusiastically enough? Who is to judge? Vosh? Felix made apology video after apology video during this period and took other efforts to try and make it plainly clear that he does not support Nazis. At one point, Vosh details the kind of apology video he wished Felix had made while responding to an apology video from Felix that met his suggestions. This is the second time Vosh has made a video responding to Felix apologizing for this. The evidence seems to suggest that Vosh would not accept any form of apology from Felix, so why would we allow Vosh to judge the sincerity of Felix's apologies? The Christchurch allegation is particularly silly given that he released an almost 90-page manifesto and Felix is mentioned zero times. He was not motivated by Felix. He was a deeply mentally ill and racist person trying to instigate a race war. As for the hoodie, Vosh admits that Felix is not wearing a Nazi symbol, even though he repeatedly tries to equivocate it as such. And was that a Georgian cross? Yes. Yes, it is. I didn't say, I didn't believe at any point that he, like, ordered it like haha this ah uh, bros this is going to be so good for the jew video i'll wear this and they would think it's the iron cross i never believed that okay so don't bring it up then 
As for ER, the worst you could say is that Felix didn't do enough research before shouting him out, which Felix acknowledged and apologized for. Now, following people on Twitter isn't an endorsement of their views. In fact, following someone on Twitter doesn't even imply you necessarily know who they are. Okay, so we have a person with roughly 5,000 hours of content online, and the argument we're making for him being a Nazi is that he worked with Ben Shapiro, a Jewish person. Do I need to explain how irresponsible this is? This wasn't a one-off thing. Vosh made four videos about this, repeatedly accusing Felix of being a Nazi. Is that just looking at it on its own? It, this could just be from like a, a gaming channel that has edgy moments. There doesn't seem to be a single piece of evidence to call Felix a Nazi instead of an edgy gamer bro, and Vosh made four videos about this. If the word Nazi applies to both Hitler and Felix, it ceases to carry any meaning. By accusing people that aren't white supremacists of being white supremacists, you are helping white supremacists. I have Vosh calling Ben Shapiro, Felix, Sagar and Jetty, Sam Harris, James Lindsay, and Jordan Peterson Nazis, or implying it so strongly that the accusation is unmistakable. And similarly, apparently Ben Shapiro, Felix, Antonin Scalia, George W. Bush, Thomas Sowell, Sagar and Jetty, Burgess Owens, James Lindsay, and Jordan Peterson are all apparently fascists, and I didn't even look for these specifically. I'm sure there are many more. This goes beyond an innocent misuse of language. Vosh purposefully equivocates these things to try and lambast his opponents as much as possible. And even in the most charitable reading, this is straightforwardly dishonest. Don't go crazy hyperbole calling everyone who ever does this a neo-Nazi. To be as good faith as possible, let's find the single video on Vosh's channel which would be least likely to contain misinformation. Vosh claims the most expertise in criminal justice, specifically corrections and supervision, and there is a video about precisely this topic, where Vosh claims expertise, and where Vosh claims to have nailed the video in the description. This video is a response to a PragerU video titled, Why Are So Many Americans in Prison? If any video on Vosh's channel is going to be trustworthy, it should be this one. This was put forward under the pretense of academic legitimacy. If you put all of this forward out of ignorance, I also think that's malicious. Actually, actually, ooh, I can't, ah. I did my baccalaureate thesis, months of research and dozens of pages of writing on the potential economic benefits of prison vocational programs. Let it first be known that I'm not defending PragerU or whoever this clown is. The premise of this video is disgusting, and nearly all of its contents are misleading. However, I only count three outright falsehoods in this video from the PragerU clown, and I also count three outright falsehoods from Vosh. The first falsehood Vosh presents is a condemnation of violent and serious offenders, either that it would be necessarily bad or ineffective to provide rehabilitative services for these people, or that letting them out early would be necessarily bad, presumably because they would be more likely to reoffend. None of this is true. Violent and sexual offenses actually have some of the most effective rehabilitation methods, and these offenders have some of the lowest rates of recidivism when compared to other kinds of criminals. Furthermore, violent and sexual offenders get the worst treatment when going through parole and being assigned terms of supervision, so they could easily be the group that is most in need of help, given the premise that our justice system is too punitive and not focused enough on rehabilitation. Every component of Vosh's claim runs contrary to the facts here. There is a reason why conservatives, like that kid, and the people who give him his money, um, are so interested in maintaining the status quo. And the reason for that is because felons can't vote. The second falsehood Vosh presents is that felons can't vote. Again, this is not true. In the vast majority of the country, felons can either vote upon completion of their sentence, or everyone outside of prison can vote. In the stripey states, some felons are permanently disenfranchised, but only in two states, Kentucky and Virginia, are all felons permanently disenfranchised. In some cases, felons may need to go through a process to have their voting rights restored, but it is still a blatant falsehood to say that felons can't vote, even in the region that Vosh is talking about. Keeping felons from voting is a deliberate effort to keep black and brown people from contributing their votes. Then, Vosh goes off the deep end and claims felons can't vote because the state hates black people. 
Yikers. First of all, it's difficult to ascribe any motivation to an institution, as institutions are made up of an incredible number of different people and policies, etc. And this is particularly true for the US correction system, where most prisoners are in state prisons and jails, and each state has their own, sometimes wildly different standards for handling corrections and supervision. To ascribe motivation to the system as a whole is stupid on its face, but then to say the motivation is racism is just blatantly wrong. Now that Fosh knows about the vast restoration of voting rights, do you think he would admit that the state loves black people? I doubt it. That's three blatant falsehoods in the video on Vosh's channel, where he should have the greatest degree of expertise, and in which he claims to have done a great job. Most of his other claims are at least partially wrong as well, but I'm more concerned with claims that he absolutely wouldn't make with a genuine expertise in criminal justice. So let's look at a few more. Our prison population is higher both per capita and in total numbers than any other fucking country on earth. How? Well, the real answer how is because of private prisons and because lobbying from those private prisons to increase both the uh, number of crimes and the sentencing length of those crimes because they profit from it. It's to make people money. That's the actual reason why, by the way. It's not just because we hate black people. It's because we hate black people and we want to make a lot of fucking money off their suffering. Here, Fosh claims that mass incarceration resulted from lobbying from private prisons. No. Private prisons do not drive correctional policy. Private prisons account for less than 9% of prisoners, and an incredibly small amount of money is spent by private prisons on lobbying. In 2020, only $4 million was spent in an $80 billion industry. That is one two hundredth of a percent. And if you go back a few years to 2014, the amount spent is under $500,000. This is particularly relevant because mass incarceration resulted from policy changes that happened in the 70s and 90s, long before private prisons had even the meager influence they carry today. Private prisons didn't cause mass incarceration, they leech off of it. This is a conspiracy theory that you could only peddle if you knew nothing about the substantive facts of the matter. Almost like they created a problem that they knew would disproportionately affect um, like black communities and then introduced mass incarceration, which they get to conveniently extract slave labor from. Then Vosh claims that the state has an incentive to lock people up for slave labor. The idea that prisoners are a profitable labor force for the state is demonstrably untrue, as the cost of incarceration dwarfs the labor value of an inmate. The state has no incentive to lock people up for slave labor, but you don't need to take my word for it because Vosh admits this in another video. Next, let's look at some other criminal justice misinformation, this time about the police. And oh boy, where do we even begin? Vosh has a huge problem with spreading misinformation about the police. Let's begin with a few entire videos that are factually incorrect. First up is a video about Aaron Danielson and Michael Reinol. Reinol stalked Danielson and shot him in the back. The video of this was available on social media within hours of the events, and Reinol was identified by authorities, but Portland police didn't apprehend Reinol. This led Trump to send in the US Marshals, which resulted in Reinol's death under circumstances which are disputed. Vosh begins the video claiming that his handling of the situation was incredibly responsible. What I wanted to do was say, this was an extrajudicial killing, this was a lynching, this was a hit put out by the government because he killed a member of Patriot Prayer, a far-right group, and the government backs the far-right. But I didn't want to be hyperbolic. The reason for that is because I'm not a fucking dumbass. I try to be responsible, for the most part, and I waited. So again, this should be a video where Vosh is at his best. Criminal justice is his area of expertise, and he was apparently extra careful to be sure he was delivering this information responsibly. Unfortunately, nearly every single detail of this video is wrong. First of all, Vosh states or implies five times that Reinol was acting in self-defense and shooting Danielson. This is a blatant lie. Reinol stalked Danielson and shot him in the back. This isn't misleading his audience about a small detail, this is perhaps the most important piece of information in the entire video, and Vosh lies about it five times, despite his earlier claims about being responsible. Remember what happens when Vosh claims to be doing a good thing. The rest of the video contains so many falsehoods I don't even have time to mention all of them. Misrepresenting the legal authority and role of police, 
misrepresenting the legal concept of innocence, misrepresenting the existence of retributive justice under the law, misrepresenting the details of the shooting of Reinhold, misrepresenting Trump's statements about Reinhold, consistently framing the killing of Reinhold as a hit put out by Trump, etc. Almost every individual statement in this video is either misinformation, gross hyperbole, or blatant fear-mongering. At points like this, when he says stuff like that, I don't know if he expects his audience to know that he's lying. I genuinely don't know. When people watch that, do they think he, they, he actually fact-checked it, or do they think he's making a joke? I genuinely do not know. Then we can look at Vosch's video in the wake of the shooting of Jacob Blake. The video begins with a blatant falsehood. Vosch claims Shapiro is invoking the he was no angel argument, but Shapiro isn't. He's discussing why police were there in the first place. It doesn't matter if Jacob Blake uh, had just finished uh, raping uh, millions of people. Impressive, uh, if nothing else. It doesn't matter. Then Vosh spreads misinformation about Blake being unarmed, continuing to misrepresent the role of police and the illegal concept of innocence, and misrepresenting other basic facts about the case. This is a video about Blake and Shapiro's response to the shooting of Blake, and Vosh totally misrepresents both of them. It's also worth pointing out that Vosh has another video about Blake, released right after the footage went public, and it is way worse. Then we can look at Vosh's video about the 2019 Miramar shootout. Vosh claimed police cars are bulletproof when they aren't, repeatedly claimed that all victims were shot by police when this still isn't known today, and Vosh additionally claimed that the UPS refused to compensate the victim who was kidnapped and murdered, despite showing evidence that UPS did compensate the family of the victim three different times during the video. And these are just the direct falsehoods, not to mention downplaying the seriousness of the original incident by insisting that no one was killed in the jewelry store when someone was shot, and spending most of the video running defense for the people who robbed the store, shot an employee, and kidnapped Frank Ordonez as an excuse to place all of the blame on police. What about insisting the umbrella guy was an undercover cop when he wasn't? This guy. I ain't got part of that kid. So we've got a person here who is essentially unidentifiable, at least by appearance, by way of the full black garb and the gas mask and everything else. Here's a thing that I know for a fact is happening. Undercover cops. There is nothing on earth that can tell me that motherfucker in the black get up with the umbrella smashing those autos on windows at the beginning of the protest wasn't a fucking cop. Or spreading misinformation about Amy Klobuchar and Derek Chauvin. Amy Klobuchar was one of the people who declined to bring charges against the officers who killed George Floyd. Or spreading misinformation about Kyle Rittenhouse. Murder? The second Doesn't shooting, he was case. literally laying on his ass, firing shots at people 20 feet away who weren't even moving towards him. or spreading misinformation about the Twitter cop planting evidence. That, why did I retweet this? I'm such a fucking idiot, dude. I trusted the fucking headline again. Are you getting the picture? And keep in mind, this is only misinformation about his greatest area of expertise. If you aren't capable of covering breaking news without spreading misinformation, then don't cover breaking news. I'm not a news outlet. I don't do breaking news, you know? Um, uh, uh, I'm not a journalist. I don't really have the... Um, uh, uh, the training or the contacts necessary to update, get, like get live information and verify it on the scene and then update. And I don't, I generally, I don't want to um, uh, propagate misinformation. Speaking of which. If you aren't capable of talking about the police without spreading misinformation, then don't talk about the police. Is this really so complicated? Also, you may be wondering why Vosh is so consistently wrong about the police. The police don't want to protect American citizens. The police don't want to uphold the law. If they wanted to do either of those things, they wouldn't be behaving the way they're behaving now. What police want is limitless power. That is what the police want. That is the only thing they want. The police as an institution want to be able to drive into the low-income districts of whatever city it ha they happen to squad in like a like an occupying force and just murder people 
I hate the police as an institution. I despise it. And we haven't even gotten to the other misinformation yet, which will now float by on screen. I have 15 pages of notes purely on Vosh's falsehoods. And keep in mind, these are only the verifiable falsehoods. I'm not including gross hyperbole or implying false information or telling half-truths, etc. How do I even cover all of this? Also keep in mind, I didn't watch all of his videos. Only about 80 of the over a thousand videos on his main channel. I didn't troll through Vosh's Twitter, or his second channel, or the various clip channels, or his streams, etc. It's not an exaggeration to say that his content is riddled with falsehoods, and that nothing he says should ever be trusted without googling it first. I could spend the next hour going through all of this, but instead, let's see what Vosh thinks about the ethics of lying. Okay, I, I said that. I personally said that. That we're comfortable accepting a level of intellectual dishonesty. Okay. Sometimes, if, if intellectual honesty is the cost of a successful improvement of the state of humanity, then sometimes that just has to be made. I'm very flexible, I guess, with, with means or methods. As but long as it leads people, people in a good direction, I think it's generally pretty defensible. People just report things that are just factually not true. That's my issue. Sure, like, they do do that. But... Vosh has been defending lying for political gain for almost 10 years, and it shows in his behavior. As we'll learn later on, this is also fully justified by his personal philosophy. Now, you don't need to take my word for it. You can check the script and my sources to verify all of this for yourself. So just beware that you can never take anything Vosh says at face value. At this point, when we're in a position where so many people are so willing to lie so fragrant, uh, flagrantly, sorry, not fragrantly, um, if they say one thing, if they make a single argument that I could disprove with a single Google search, then what does that say about the rest of the information they have for you? In all likelihood, it means that everything they're saying is horseshit. They're just cobbling together as many stories as they can, and that disproving one of them is enough to dispel the credibility of the rest of the arguments. There is not a good base of conservatives in this country. These people are no different from the Ku Klux Klan. They are no different from the fucking white nationalists who ran terror campaigns during, in the South back during the 1920s, 30s, 40s. They are absolutely no different from the frothing at the mouth, screaming fucking pasty mayo people who are throwing rocks at black folk going to integrated schools. There is no difference. I, I completely reject this idea. I completely reject this idea that there has been some sort of noble transition of the conservative base in this country because it hasn't happened, people. It's still there. They're exactly the same. Nothing has changed. If you have a conservative family member, I'm sorry, they're part of the problem. If you have a conservative friend, I'm sorry, they're part of the problem. Now we arrive at the part of the video where I need to start making controversial statements, and it's incredibly embarrassing to me that this will be taken as controversial but there are perfectly decent reasons to be a conservative that have nothing to do with racism. Rather than play a bunch of clips of Vosh dehumanizing these people, I'm just going to let his comments scroll by on screen while I talk. The people who agree with Vosh argue through the lens of historical materialism, and it is precisely through this lens that we see the most common reason people become conservatives. They perceive paying taxes to be against their class interests. This should be the most obvious thing in the world. It's literally a foundational principle for Vosh's worldview. This is also reflected in polls of policy rankings for conservatives. A good chunk of conservatives are single-issue voters on reducing taxation, and I've spoken with several people who voted for Trump who said he disgusted them, and they were sickened to do it. Does that sound familiar? I heard the same thing from people who voted for Hillary. Voting for someone is not an endorsement of all their views. Obviously, Vosh doesn't agree with Biden on much, he just sees Biden as being preferable to Trump. Now. What a lot of people on the left fail to realize is that Democrats like Biden. I'm not saying you have to, because I don't. Now, really quickly, we need to talk about Trump. I hate Trump. Don't take this as a defense of Trump or his behavior. It's indefensible. But while I'm not willing to defend Trump, I am willing, to some degree, to defend the people who voted for Trump especially against reckless hyperbole coming from people like Vosh. The main reasons people accuse Trump voters of being racist are immigration policy, the border wall, and the travel ban. 
Now, before we get into the data of what Trump voters actually think on these issues, let's realize that strict views on immigration don't make a person racist. Do you think Denmark is racist? Denmark's immigration policies are much more strict than the United States. From what I can tell, the current Republican sentiment on immigration was bipartisan in the US until after 2012, and these views are still somewhat common abroad. That doesn't make them racists. And if you actually do have the data on your side, you're going to have a much easier time changing their mind by saying you're wrong about the facts than you're a terrible racist piece of shit. And keep in mind, you'd only need to convert about 10% of the Republican base for them to never win a national election again. If you care about political efficacy, you should be very concerned with maximizing your appeal to that 10%, rather than focusing on how bad the worst 10% of the party is. Another thing to point out is that lots of people who voted for Trump probably don't care about immigration at all. Between 55 and 65% of Republicans think immigration should be a priority, meaning that at least one in three simply don't care. In list of policy priority, it's usually around fourth, sometimes as low as ninth, and is always getting completely crushed by the economy. This is a strong indication that Republicans care way more about things like taxes than immigration. When looking at issue by issue polling, things get way more complicated. Roughly 80% of Republicans favored the travel bans, but so did roughly 50% of independents and 10 to 35% of Democrats. That doesn't mean 10 to 35% of Democrats are racist. The travel bans might be taken as a hatred of Muslims, but when asked if Christians should be given priority in immigration, 90% of Americans said religion shouldn't matter. There was between 65 to 80% support of the border wall among Republicans, but 40 to 50% of Republicans supported Dreamers. 55% of Trump supporters think illegal immigrants are as honest and hardworking as American citizens. And you'll see up to 60% support among Republicans of allowing illegal immigrants to stay if they meet certain conditions. Clearly, this is a bit more complicated than Republicans just hating Hispanic people. Then there were some other interesting findings, like 50% of Republicans saying black Americans faced a lot of discrimination, 45% of Republicans supporting Biden's infrastructure plan that was basically a small version of the Green New Deal, 50% of Republican voters supporting UBI, 45% of Republicans supporting a public option, and 50% of Republicans saying they wish Trump was more presidential and less of a man-child on Twitter. I'm sorry, but this doesn't look like a party of hard-bitten racists. What it looks like to me is a party of people who are collectively vulnerable to fear-mongering about immigration and want to be safe. If you want to get through to these people, the best way to do that isn't to call them racists. If you accuse someone who isn't racist of being a racist, they are likely to write you off entirely. You don't get to complain about conservatives fixating on the culture war if you're in the trenches yourselves. The accusations of Republicans being fascists are honestly so hilarious, <laughs> I'm not even going to bother finding sources. Perhaps the single greatest aim of the GOP is to dismantle the government, which is the opposite of what a fascist would want. Not to mention, Trump stacked the judiciary, which proceeded to unanimously rule against him and his comical efforts to overturn the election. If these people are fascists, then they are very fucking bad at it. Now, you might think Republicans are rubes for allowing themselves to be consumed by fear-mongering, but this is hardly restricted to Republicans. Fear-mongering is a derogatory term for a type of behavior uh, exhibited in a lot of political figures online, especially conservatives, uh, where it uh, you try to um, present information in a way that warrants an unnecessary or exaggerated fear response from your audience. This is from the Ryan Ole video. Now that you know pretty much every piece of information in this video is false, watch these clips and tell me what you think Fosh's goal with this video was. What I wanted to do was say, this was an extrajudicial killing, this was a lynching, this was a hit put out by the government because he killed a member of Patriot Prayer, a far-right group, and the government backs the far right. This was a hit. This was a hit on a political opponent. It could happen to any one of you. You realize that, right? And they will fucking kill you. They will roll up on your house like they are a rival gang, and they will perforate the front of your house while civilians flee to get their eight-year-olds out of the line of fire. It is impossible for me to describe the degree to which our society faces oblivion. We face oblivion 
Yeehaw, boys. H here's your silver badge. Let's go do a lynching. Now you gotta wonder, every day of your life, are they gonna deputize a bunch of fucking white nationalists to gun me down in front of my house? Are they going to kill me without even announcing themselves? Are they going to kill my family? We face the greatest conceivable threat to our well-being um, imaginable right now as, as, as activists and left-leaning people. So you tell me, viewer, how did that make you feel? Are you vulnerable to fear-mongering? If you're willing to concede that you are, maybe Republican voters are a bit more sympathetic than you thought. And last, let's look at a few more hopeful clips. First, this was Bill O'Reilly's reaction to the murder of Eric Garner. However, however, I will say that upon seeing the video that you just saw and hearing Mr. Gardner say he could not breathe, I was extremely troubled. I would have loosened my grip. I desperately wish the officer would have done that. Eric Gardner was obese. He had asthma. He was in no condition to absorb what befell him. Yes, he should not have resisted. But all Americans, every one of us, should pity Mr. Gardner and his family. He did not deserve what happened to him. And I think Officer Pantaleo and every other American police officer, every one, would agree with me. He didn't deserve that. O'Reilly was basically Tucker Carlson 1.0, and in this video, he gets pretty close to calling the killing a lynching. O'Reilly unambiguously sides with Garner's family and against the police. There is no black man who could die at the hands of the police whose treatment they would not then defend or laud. What was Fox News' initial reaction to the murder of George Floyd? Where's the training of these guys? How do you not know the neck is that sensitive? And, and Sean... Where is the, the officers that are standing near this guy who are willing to stand up and stop him? But the protesters are looking at what the local police have done and they haven't arrested anybody. Um, if you or I were caught on tape choking someone to death, I would assume that we'd be in prison by now. Why do you think there are, the people on the ground feel like there has not been justice? And what is the White House going to do about that? Yeah, Martha, I can tell you, take the uniform off of that police officer, just have a man with his knee on another man's neck, there'd already be an arrest. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't need to wait on the yeah. feds. This is a violation of Minnesota state law. This is murder. And does anyone remember when Bernie Sanders had a town hall with an audience from Fox? Is raising a starvation minimum wage of $7.25 an hour which has not been raised in 10 years to $15 an hour, a living wage, a radical idea. Oh. Is making public colleges and universities tuition free so that all of our people have the opportunity to get a higher education in a competitive global economy. Is that a radical idea? Oh. Is doing what every other major country on earth does guaranteeing health care to all as a right. I live 50 miles away from the Canadian border. This is not a communist society up there in Montreal. <laughs> they guarantee health care to all. They spend 50% of what we spend is passing a Medicare for all single payer system. A radical idea. No! And let's remind ourselves, what does Vosh have to say about all this? All of conservatism is built upon the exact same social principles that are perpetuated today by neo-Nazis. I understand this may sound a little bit facetious, but I assure you I'm being entirely serious when I say this. American conservatives are fascists. Now, I have been accused of being hyperbolic in this respect before, uh, but I am not being. Uh, there is a large contingent of conservatives in this country, not all of them, but a large number of them, uh, who just like it when black people are killed. And I think the first thing that we should learn from this story, I mean, what's the first thing we should learn here? Conservatives are evil? Great, easy, wow. And Republicans want to do that because Republicans are racist. I don't think neoconservatism and fascism are two like really, really distinct things. A lot of people in the Republican party probably do just want to say the N word and like throw rocks at black people. Ah, yes. Nuance. 
It's fine to not like conservatives, but it is not acceptable to act like everyone who votes Republican is a Nazi. Doing so is politically destructive, demonstrably untrue, and deeply counterproductive to progressive goals. We can talk to these people. We can work with these people. But that's never going to happen if we think that half of the country are literally Nazis. And I think that that passion requires a lot of introspection because there are a lot of people out there who think they're making the world a better place, when in reality they're making it a, a horrible place to live in. This section needs some disclaimers. I am not an expert in philosophy. However, I did consult with a number of people who are, so I should do a reasonable job of explaining these ideas. And second, I made a serious effort to charitably assess Foch's moral system, but there simply isn't any way to account for all the contradictory things he's said. From my vantage point, Vosh's moral system is just whatever is needed at the time to justify what he wants to do or say. That being said, I was able to synthesize his most common moral statements to come up with two primary positions he may be defending. The first position Vosh seems to support is direct, actual consequentialism. Consequentialism means that the moral worth of an action is determined by the consequences of that action. Most consequentialist positions consider intentions or expected outcomes, because human agents don't have access to the future. But with Vosh, we have a problem. Vosh only takes intentions or expected outcomes into consideration for people he likes. This is very much an intentions for me, outcomes for thee kind of situation. This inconsistency undermines any claim Vosh may have to being a genuine consequentialist. To have a genuine position, he would either need to consider intentions for his opposition, or not consider intentions for his allies. The second position Vosh expresses is metanormative nihilism. You would think I was lying if I described this myself, so I'll let Vosh explain it to you. You're in a state of complete nihilism about the world. No, no one's I, position I care is more things. justified than another. Inherently, no. Correct. It's, it's not a matter of absurdity. It's how the world works. I think it's a fact of the world. I don't think you can empirically justify any of this. All of history and all of thought is just power grabs between people who can decide wow. subjectively okay. whether or not their positions Matt are better than others. power grabs. Unironically? Wow. In some cases? The yes. truth of whether the Holocaust happened? A power grab. Yes! Wow. Okay. Yes! Well, with that, I'm going to peace out. There is no good and evil. There is only power. And those too weak to seek it. Metanormative nihilism is the position that there is no truth and there is no morality. A natural consequence of this is a belief that the world is nothing but a power game, which Vosh seems to fully embrace. In practice, this is the position that Vosh acts out far more than the first position, but it's hard to believe he actually understands it, because the position of metanormative nihilism is beyond absurd. When I explained Vosh's positions to a professor of ethics and political philosophy, he responded that Vosh wasn't advocating for socialism, he's advocating for Syria. And this is because something like the Syrian state in the middle of a civil war is exactly what things would look like were everyone to adopt metanormative nihilism. It's just a power game. There are no right or wrong actions. In fact, there's no truth at all. Just do whatever you can do to get ahead. In this worldview, there was nothing wrong with slavery before 1863. And in fact, there's nothing wrong with slavery at all in a moral sense. It's only wrong in a legal sense. The law is the only basis you have for judging people's actions, which gives some insight into why Vosh becomes so concerned with the law in situations where people might normally discuss morality. The Kyle Rittenhouse situation comes to mind. If Vosh was to adopt this position seriously, he would have no cause to complain on moral grounds about anything anyone ever did. You could torture him, kill his entire family, and cannibalize them, and Vosh would have no good reason to object on moral grounds. It seems very unlikely for anyone to actually see the world this way. In practice, Vosh's position is that of a moral free rider. It justifies any actions Vosh may like to take, while Vosh can hide behind the cloak of common moral sentiment knowing that no one will take him up on his bargain. He even admits as such. So I don't want to get punched in the face, but I want other people to get punched in the face. So I've had to develop 
a and you know pardon me for sound of pretentious i've had to develop a um a set of principles and of ways in which those principles could be practically enacted um which allow for the punching of Nazis and don't allow for the punching of me and my soft jaw. Now you, viewer, are free to adopt whatever normative position you like, but I strongly suggest you don't adopt one similar to this that makes you look like a fucking lunatic. Instead of trying to disentangle all this nonsense, I'll instead recap some parts of the platonic dialogue Gorgias, as it covers most of the relevant themes to address Vosh's behavior. Gorgias is a dialogue between Socrates and a group of sophists, including the titular Gorgias, a rhetorician, and his students. We begin with Gorgias identifying himself as a rhetorician, which is particularly relevant because Vosh is also chiefly concerned with rhetoric, persuasion, and optics. I think the impact of rhetoric uh, as a, as in the positions that we're in um, is always going to be greater than the impact of policy. Then they clarify that the use of rhetoric produces conviction, but not knowledge. In plain English, they're saying that someone can be persuasive while also being clueless. Oh yeah, wait, didn't Bush literally steal the 2000 election? I'm sorry, somebody in chat just mentioned that, but yeah, the 2000 election was shady as shit. I completely forgot with, with the Jeb Bush and the governor of Florida and the butterfly bouts. I completely forgot that. He literally, he got away with it, actually. He got away with stealing that election. Then they discuss the obvious implication. Rhetoric would be a horrible tool to be wielded by an amoral person. Gorgias affirms that only a just person should wield rhetoric. I don't believe morals are a fact of the world. In response to this, Socrates criticizes rhetoric as being immoral. To Socrates, with the use of rhetoric, the concepts of right and wrong become perverted into whatever can help one gain power. And rhetoric goes hand in hand with manipulativeness. I care about my truth in the world. Then, Gorgias' student Polis gets ass mad that Gorgias is losing the debate and decides to jump in, telling Socrates that it's ridiculous to expect someone to admit that they are an immoral person. Socrates then explains, at considerable length, that he sees rhetoric as a form of ornamental flattery. He explains that sophistry and rhetoric merely impersonate the legislative process and the administration of justice. This establishes a full critique of rhetoric. Number one, Rhetoric produces conviction, not knowledge. Number two, rhetoric is a dangerous tool to be wielded by an immoral person. And number three, rhetoric merely impersonates the greater arts of law and ethics. Furthermore, Polis's previous statement is particularly troublesome, because we can't expect someone wielding rhetoric to know whether or not they are just, meaning rhetoricians had the tools to enact evil without knowing whether or not they are evil. Vosch will always claim to have a resolute moral compass, but when pressed, he'll admit that he doesn't even think morals exist, and the world is merely a theater for power games. Such a person wielding rhetoric is a dangerous thing indeed. Socrates then begins to compare rhetoricians to tyrants, and begins to argue that rhetoric is self-defeating, because utilizing rhetoric to stir conviction without wisdom leads one to act against their own self-interest. This is the beginning of a long conversation about the nature of justice, which continues when Callicles jumps into the conversation. Callicles begins making an immoralist argument that is critical of philosophy itself, which is similar to the arguments made by Glaucon and Thrasymachus in other works of Plato. Callicles' position is very similar to Vosch's position, rejecting morality and embracing a might-makes-right mentality. While Vosch claims to be a socialist, he avoids ethical arguments for socialism, and now we can see why. The metanormative landscape that Vosch acts out is one of authoritarianism or extremely exploitative capitalism not socialism. The moral systems that exist in philosophy that are most similar to Vosch's position all seem to support authoritarianism, down to the criticism of philosophy itself. I have no respect for snobby moral realists. Socrates and Gorgias warned the danger posed by rhetoric in the hands of an immoral person. Looking at Vosch's behavior, it's not hard to understand why. But I would probably argue that was because you have your limited capacities in terms of philosophy. It's probably because you got a sociology degree, right? <laughs> what is fascism in abstract? What is abstract yeah. fascism in abstract? It's really easy. It's great to get a definition yeah. from Vosh. Yeah. Ah. Well, generally, it's considered to be like a um, an ultra right wing, ultra nationalistic um, form of like um, 
usually like an ethno-nationalist political identity. Um, I prefer Umberto Eco's 14 points, but it gets like really in the weeds. I don't think that fascism Umberto is always Echo. super consistent with its definition. Well, the reason that I like Umberto Eco's definition so much, the reason why I simp for it so goddamn hard, is because it's very, very sociological. That's the thing that I like about it. Isn't it too broad though? Serious question, no troll. It's it's only um, it's only like too broad if you look at it as like if you f trigger like one flag, then you're a fascist, which isn't true. It's like diagnostic criteria for mental disorders. Yes. The problem with what Vosh just said is that the DSM does have a threshold you need to cross for a diagnosis, so it's not applicable to how Vosh uses Eco's definition. It's very convenient that Eco's definition can't be used to make definitive judgments. But you should at the very least be able to get an idea of how fascist something is by looking at these points. So, how much of a fascist is Vosh? Matt are better than all power grabs. Unironically? Wow. In some cases? The yes. truth of whether the Holocaust happened? A power grab. Yes! Wow. Okay. Yes! Well, with Uh, and I'm going to make every conceivable effort to be charitable. The Republican Party is literally mostly voted on by fascists. Take yes for an answer when somebody agrees with you, dude. But they don't agree with me. I have never met a Republican who agrees with me on anything. I have never met a self-described conservative who shared a single goal with me. The average Republican would have supported Hitler, 100%. Yeah, that's the easiest call in my life. I believe that the property rights of the wealthy should not be respected. I feel that their um, uh, uh, assets should be seized from them and that many of them should be executed for crimes against the workers of this country. Fascists in America have been trying to destroy this country and turn it into an autocracy, well, more of one, for generations. They aren't a burgeoning movement of youth. They're funded by billionaires. They're funded by bankers and oil moguls. They're funded by politicians whose dads and their dads' dads were politicians. There have literally been studies done on the authoritarian brain. Um, tend to be lower IQ, more fearful, um, more impressionable. We are going to see a resurgence of global fascism sometime over the next 20 years. We know what we're doing is right. We will improve society, whether society likes it or not. Donald Trump is a fascist, and the legislators uh, uh, for the Republican Party are fascist because they almost, almost to a man, back pretty much everything that he does. Do you really think it's that unlikely that the third branch of government would also, with judges appointed, by the way, by a fascist, might also have leanings in that direction? Have you ever read the book 1984? 1984 is literally my favorite book. Okay, so it's actually, it's a really, really good point because the way that they alter the minds of the people in Right, Europa, is through um, Newspeak. Yeah, is it Europia or Utopia? What do they call it? Neuropia? They call it um, uh, Oceana. Oceana, oh, fuck, fuck me. <laughs> Sorry. So the way that, the way that okay. they, the one of their leading ways of changing the minds of the people in Oceana isn't by indoctrinating them, but by depriving them of the words to express any thought that's counterproductive to what the party wants them to think, you know? Exactly. So, it's yeah. a beautiful book. But but that's not beautiful. Like that's fucked up. You're you're essentially saying that people are too stupid and too immature and blah 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 blah. So what we need to do is we need to dictate to them by giving them no other choice but to think certain things based on like Stephen, their vocabulary and Stephen, what, what? That's politics and you agree with me. No, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not, but it's and kind of along the same ideas to where, like, well, we're just no, going to kind of get people to think what we want to think by just making all of the words mean this. Like, it's kind of the same thing. It's not the exact same thing, but it's kind of the same Steven, along the same lines. The difference, the difference is that we're doing what we're doing because we genuinely believe that there is a large, large group of people out there who are suffering because we haven't done this fast enough. Okay? That's why we do it. Now, I understand that from an objective standpoint, this might sound like fucking dictatorial language 101, but what do you have to fear from us? But I've shifted a fair degree away from authoritarianism mm -hmm. um, over the past couple of years.
Just to be clear, my point isn't to prove that Vosh is a fascist, he clearly isn't. However, this is not a functional definition of fascism. There's far too much ambiguity to simply call anyone you dislike a fascist. And for the record, Vosh does meet more of these criteria than almost anyone he calls a fascist. Which is amusing, but it doesn't mean much beyond Vosh should stop calling everyone fascists. Vivian gave a much more salient definition in the prime case fascism shit show. So fascism, very, very simply, I think it is perfectly reasonable, colloquially, right, to define fascism as, as, as ultra-nationalism with a desire to purify the bulk of people based on, their under, uh, based on their immutable characteristics or of behaviors deemed degenerate through religious uh, means. That's it. That'll do. Good definition. It also rules out nearly everyone Vosh calls a fascist, and Vivian agrees. Intent was... For the love of fucking God, Pisco, stop fucking lumping me in with Vosh when I'm quite, I'm quite clearly saying that I think he's being irresponsible in his rhetoric, okay. and I disagree with his idea that, like, George Bush is a fascist, okay? Like, people will say to me, right, oh, you just call everybody fascist, right? And I would really love to be sitting here right next to Vosh as Destiny comes in and says, this is fucking inappropriate, this is what all the fucking lefties do, like, fascism's lost all fucking meaning, or, like, the general, that was the general gist of, like, what he was saying as he came in. I would love to be able to fucking sit here and go, oh, th that's fucking bollocks, Destiny, actually, shut the fuck up. But I can't do that when I've got a dude next to me fucking sitting there going, well, actually, like, I think it's perfectly reasonable to just jump in and call, um, call, like, Bush a fascist, right? Even Vivian, someone who is almost totally aligned with Vosh, finds these empty accusations of fascism tedious and irritating. While Vosh certainly isn't a fascist, it is worth mentioning that he has far more authoritarian tendencies than he lets on. What does Vosh think he should do if people disagree with him past a certain point? Yeah, of course, that's subjective morals. The only thing you can really do with people who disagree with you at that point is kill them. If a person disagreed with that, I would have to kill them. Uh, I'm going I to keep going that. back to that argument a few times, so I hope you don't mind hearing it. And I'd so be more anyone interested. anyone who disagrees with you ethically should die. How many times do I have to repeat this? If they have so huge... Anyone who wait, if they have huge ethics. presuppositional differences with me on, on ethics and what is and is okay. not good, then yeah, uh -huh. that's how history has worked. Does Vosh have any self-doubt about his behavior? We know what we're doing is right. I know my positions are sound. I know the things that I do here on my platform are good, or at least I don't really care if he would argue that they're not. Yikes. Look, I'm not saying Vosh wants to be a dictator, but what I am saying is that there is enough troubling material here to merit genuine concern. Maybe I, maybe I should stop calling people fascists if my audience can't handle it, okay? Stochastic terrorism is when the distribution of propaganda via mass media meaningfully increases the likelihood of violent events taking place, particularly with a political motivation. The stochastic terrorist is someone who contributes to a political environment where violence is more likely to happen, but the violence itself can never be directly linked back to the stochastic terrorist. If you want to see a good breakdown of the concept, check out this Booksmarts video on Trump's speech before the January 6th Capitol insurrection. This is a video about Vosh, though, so we can let Vosh explain. There's a term called stochastic terrorism. Uh, has anyone ever heard the stories of back when environmental terrorism was a little bit more popular than it is today? Funny, because it should, if there was ever a time for it to be popular, it would be today. If the chainsaw ever hit that stake, the belt of the chainsaw is designed to cut through wood, not steel. The belt would break, meaning that the chainsaw, spinning very, very quickly, would send a belt laced with razor-sharp spikes flying out in any direction, damaging equipment, and if there was a person nearby, very likely them. People were injured and sometimes killed from this practice. I'm not taking a stance on this uh, right now. I... Uh... <laughs> Um, I, I, I am personally not in favor of the idea of stochastic terrorism against, um, like, loggers or whatever. I don't think that's a particularly effective way of making the world a better place. Um, though I can't really blame the motive. 
Imagine explaining stochastic terrorism to your audience, and then pausing your explanation to engage in stochastic terrorism. Twice. Vosch both implicitly and explicitly endorses environmental terrorism here, which increases the likelihood of environmental terrorism taking place, although it could never be linked directly back to him. Quite incredible, but this is only the tip of the iceberg. Trump never directly called for violence on January 6th, but he didn't need to. What Trump was trying to do was convince his audience that their country was being stolen from them and they need to take it back. The speech was meant to build a sense of unity and terror in his audience, then it ends with this. We are going to the Capitol. We're going to try and give the weak Republicans the kind of pride and boldness they need to take back our country. Is this a direct call for violence? No. However, you would be lying if you said this didn't increase the chance of violence taking place. That's what stochastic terrorism is. However, Trump's speech has a cloak of plausible deniability. For one, Trump never justifies or calls for political violence. Violence is a logical outcome of what he's saying, but there is a natural defense that fear-mongering and getting people riled up is simply what politicians do. However, most people on the left still accept this speech as a clear instance of stochastic terrorism and make no qualms about holding Trump partially responsible for the events of January 6th. And I would agree. To what degree he's responsible, it's hard to say, but at the very least, this rhetoric is incendiary and irresponsible. We already played the clip where Vosh unironically called for the genocide of the wealthy, but maybe you think he was being hyperbolic. What is Vosh's position on political violence? You know that whole joke I do with uh, political violence is wrong, always wrong, never do it, not even in Minecraft, it's immoral to hurt people thing? And it's always with a wink and a nod, and everyone knows my real position. You guys know I do that, right? Yeah. I have like 30 clips of this going back a decade. Vosh is an open advocate for political violence. This is the first major reason Vosh engages in stochastic terrorism. By openly advocating for political violence, he is clearly increasing the probability that his audience will engage in political violence. Then we have Vosh's open advocacy for a violent revolution, including comments that imply anyone in favor of capitalism is a fair target for violence. Vosh explicitly mentions social democracy here, saying social democracy may be the biggest obstacle to his desired political system. For those of you who don't know, social democracy is as far left as you can go economically without being a socialist, so Vosh is in favor of murdering anyone who isn't a socialist if that is what it takes. This would all be bad enough, but we haven't even gotten to the main point. Vosh's spreading of misinformation about and inciting hostility towards the police. You don't just, you, you don't just like, oh yeah, we're rolling through the hood. Oh, hey, hey, watch out, watch out, watch out. Buh, buh, buh. So when police officers kill somebody, as they often do here in America, this is the police! And the police fucking kill, like, one robber and, like, seven employees. The police think of your rights as an obstacle in between them and the sick John Wick movie scenes they want to enact on you in your living room, okay? Your human rights and your legal rights are nothing but a bureaucratic impediment to them getting to do their sick kickflip into headshotting you from two houses down the road, the bullet passing through a five-year-old and a dog on the way, okay? It's just an inconvenience to them. Quick, now bring me that ID! I didn't say Simon Says! First, let's look at the scale of officer-involved shootings in the United States. According to the Washington Post database, which seems to be the best source since it started in 2015, there are less than 1,000 officer-involved shootings a year, from something like 65 million police interactions. Compare this to 435,000 deaths from cigarette smoking, 112,000 from obesity, 85,000 from alcohol, 43,000 from traffic accidents, and 16,000 from Advil overdoses. No, I can't do math. Never mind. Listen, I'm a sociology major, okay? Listen, I didn't pay attention in stats. Just whatever. Of the 1,000 people killed per year by police, roughly 64 are unarmed. But this is still misleading because almost all of these unarmed people were actively resisting arrest. When you narrow these statistics down to people who are unarmed and aren't resisting arrest, you are dealing with less than five people a year. Do you believe one individual anecdote is 
prep is more meaningful than the plurality of evidence? No. There is no serious argument that officer-involved shootings constitute a pressing health risk, an epidemic, or even a systemic problem. Officer-involved shootings are incredibly rare, and you are eight times more likely to be struck by lightning than to be killed by police when you aren't resisting arrest. This is relevant because Foch clearly implies that the police enjoy killing people, and do so for no good reason, which simply doesn't happen. On the other hand, police have a greater than 10% chance per person per year to be the victims of violence, and there were more than 1.2 million violent crimes in the US in 2019, for a roughly 1 in 272 chance of being victimized per person per year. This means that while being unjustly killed by police is not a rational worry, being the victim of violence in the United States is, and this is especially true if you are a police officer. And last, and this was incredibly surprising to me, there isn't any strong evidence to suggest that police-involved shootings are racially motivated. I'm not just talking about the Fryer study, which was much publicized and discussed. I spent a day looking up meta-analyses and systematic reviews of officer-involved shootings and didn't find a single paper that unambiguously made a connection between the victim's race and the chance of a police shooting. I expected this segment to be talking about effect sizes and putting the scope of police racism in context, but every single review I found suggested a weak or non-existent connection. In Klom's 2010 review, only two of 17 studies suggested a positive correlation between victim race and police use of force, while eight studies suggested no correlation. Harris's 2009 review states, the seriousness of the offense and the behavior of the suspect appear to have a substantially large impact on how the police behave in comparison to an officer's personal beliefs and characteristics or their organizational environment. Bulger's 2015 analysis states, the increased likelihood of force for these groups were 1.064 minority suspects, but goes on to say that of the variables that were correlated with use of force, four lost significance when adjustments for publication bias were made. Offense seriousness, number of officers, suspect race, and suspect demeanor. Again, this was shocking to me. I expected to be putting evidence of police racism in context, but I spent a day trying to find and understand as much as I could and found no credible evidence that the victim's race has anything to do with officer-involved shootings. That isn't to say that there is no demonstrable racism in police use of force generally, but these findings are far more nuanced than what Vosh presents. And you might be wondering, if that is the case, why don't we hear about white unarmed innocent people being killed by police? I don't know, but they definitely exist. I'm not willing to go into the anecdotal details because that's how we got here in the first place, but just know that there are actually more cases of unarmed white people who aren't resisting being killed by police than people of color. From a propagandistic standpoint, if you're watching content like this and the arguments that are being made seem to be formed from cherry picking rather than like data, then there's probably not much merit to the claims that are being made. I don't actually mind discussing like what would be conservative policy. I just wish it was more fact-based. Then beyond the rampant misinformation, Vosh also engages in performative cruelty and dehumanization of police. This video is responding to a video of a police officer having a nervous breakdown, and Vosh does admit this. And I agree. This does seem to be one person having a nervous breakdown. Okay, so let's recap. This cop is having a nervous breakdown, posts a video to TikTok, then the video blows up. So now this cop is in the national news and is the center of attention for what might be the worst day of her life. Let's see how Vosh handles this. The thing she was going to say at the end was, all I want are my lynchings back. But even this woman, even this highly um, upsettable human being. It's pretty obvious nothing happened, but this woman is freaking out about it anyway. Which brings me to the actual issue with this, because I don't particularly care if one of the, what, 700,000 cops in this country is kind of wonky. I don't particularly care that much. You know what I do care about? The fragility. I think that this woman and the support that she is seeing on social media is deeply frightening. So I hope, and I, I encourage all of you to get on this, that we all make fun of her as aggressively as possible. 
legitimately sickening. If you didn't know what performative cruelty was before, now you know. Vosh is calling on his community to harass a woman who is in the national spotlight for having a nervous breakdown. And what's worse, his audience seems to have no empathy for this situation at all. The goal here is to inspire contempt of a person that you don't like. This situation has nothing to do with the police. This is just the worst day of one woman's life who happens to be a police officer. We have no idea what happened. She may have just been shot at. She may have just had a miscarriage. Or maybe nothing happened. But it doesn't matter. This behavior from Vosh is absolutely disgusting. And the response from chat makes it abundantly clear that his audience is not capable of empathizing with police officers. Alright, so Vosh is an open advocate for political violence, spreads an incredible amount of misinformation about the police, and has successfully dehumanized his audience to the police. How might this amount to stochastic terrorism? On August 23rd, 2020, Jacob Blake was shot seven times by police officers in Kenosha, Wisconsin. This immediately led to civil unrest around the United States, including a riot in Kenosha. At this riot, two people were fatally shot, and a third was badly injured. Vosh is usually concerned with the sociological causes of events, not the individuals involved. So what were the sociological causes of the Kenosha riots? That much is clear. The incredible amount of anti-police sentiment in the zeitgeist. The shooting of Jacob Blake was immediately seen as a lynching and taken as further evidence of brutal police misconduct across the United States. But here's the problem. That's not what happened at all. Jacob Blake was in the process of stealing a car and kidnapping children from someone whom he was previously alleged to have sexually assaulted, and Blake had a felony warrant out for his arrest for that incident. Officers at the scene both tackled Blake and deployed tasers. Neither of those stopped him. Blake was armed with a knife. It wasn't in his car. He already had it. Blake wasn't just resisting arrest, he was flagrantly ignoring officers' orders while in the act of committing multiple felonies, including kidnapping children. Officers fired on Blake when there was literally no other choice, aside from allowing him to steal a car and presumably start a car chase that may impact innocent civilians. If ever in history there was a justifiable police shooting, it was this one. And they should do that. If there's a murderer, or a rapist, or somebody running amok, if there's somebody with a gun in a building holding a hostage, I want the police there. So why did people respond as though this was a lynching? Because of people like Vosh. There is an incredible amount of misinformation and misunderstanding surrounding police in the United States, as I explained previously. These ideas floating around in the zeitgeist that police are an insurgent force of white supremacists who just want to kill black people is the reason the Kenosha riots happened. Vosh is always fixated on the sociological causes of events, so this can't be ignored. Now, ask yourself, where may people have gotten these ideas? They're trained, they're taught from day one at the academy that they are these warrior kings, these aggressors whose job it is to walk amongst the peasantry, to keep order, this killology philosophy. And it makes them angry, it makes them defensive, it makes them paranoid. I want you to really take a moment to consider the fucking black hole that cop has instead of a heart. Yeah, cops do think civilians are subhuman, by the way. 100%. They do. They 100% do. Cops don't give a fuck about lawful protest, okay? I soft-talk this shit pretty often. There are some good cops, but I want to be perfectly clear about this. As an institution, the police think of your rights as an obstacle in between them and the sick John Wick movie scenes they want to enact on you in your living room, okay? Yeehaw, boys. Here's your silver badge. Let's go do a lynching. 
than the dipshit fucking 85 IQ high school bullies who go get a job as a cop because they want to beat up all the people uh, who they think took Stacy away from them before prom. Cops are such fucking pussies, bro. Every, every interaction with the cop is like a fucking is 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 a you're you're playing Russian roulette except somebody else is holding the gun. Because uh, the police, as we all know, are a gang. I think, what I think privately, and I do believe this, by the way, I think oftentimes these cops just think of themselves as, like, rogue warriors against the degeneracy of society. And a lot of them, because cops overwhelmingly voted for Trump, probably just think that the world would be better if there were fewer non-white people in the country. The government has decided it is okay for police to just fucking kill you. I mean, the average cop is, let's be frank, a low IQ high school bully, former wannabe footba uh, football pro, who, um, who who can't make it with any intellectual <laughs> skills. And it is the fucking mafia. This is mafia. The cops are a gang. They're a gang in the commission of the state, but they are a gang nonetheless. They operate identically to a mafia. Identically. And they will fucking kill you. They will roll up on your house like they are a rival gang, and they will perforate the front of your house while civilians flee to get their eight-year-olds out of the line of fire. It is impossible for me to describe the degree to which our society faces oblivion. We face oblivion. Kyle Rittenhouse crossed state lines and pulled the trigger. But tell me, Vosh, if we care about the sociological and cultural causes of these events, who was responsible? So now we return to the title of the video. Is Vosh evil? Well. According to his moral system, all that matters are outcomes. He has engaged in a horrendous level of bad faith engagement, spread an incredible amount of misinformation, contributed to the dehumanization of half the population, promulgated an incoherent and amoral philosophy, behaved as a reckless authoritarian, and engaged in a serious level of sarcastic terrorism. And keep in mind, this video was exclusively focused on Vosch's arguments and actions as a public figure. If we were to dig into his personal life, there are some obvious events that jump to mind that would help support my conclusion. What is the measure of a man-child? You're free to come to your own conclusions, but I feel I've adequately supported mine. <laughs> 